Hello everybody, welcome to the Little Woman podcast. Those of you who are new here, my name is Nina and I am the host and the creator of this podcast. I am very excited about this new season and I look forward to share all these new discussions with you. When I started to do this podcast, in the beginning I really wanted to focus on episodes that handled Amy's, Loris and Fredrik's characters because they tend to be those characters who are most misunderstood in the Little Woman fandom. Amy and Fredrik notably the most, they tend to get a lot of hate, which I believe is a result of romanticization of Laurie in the adaptations. But pretty much from the beginning of this podcast, people have been asking more episodes about Meg and Beth as well. And when it comes to Meg's and John's marriage, it is important to know that it was very much based on reality. Their characters were partially inspired by Louisa's sister, Anna Alcott, and her husband, John Pratt. After John passed away, Louisa wrote in her diary that she came to love him like a brother, and that without him the family could not have gone through many of the hardships that they had faced. John in Lumen fandom doesn't always get that type of similar respect. Maybe it is once again because of the adaptations. I think he's a good, very stable character in the novel. When it comes to the male characters, focus is not that much on John. It is more in Laurie and Friedrich. That is just the way it is. My guest, Jen Brady, has written a young adult book series called March Sister Sweet Romance. And in these next three episodes, we will be discussing about her second book, in the series called Falling for the Future, which is a modern day little woman story told from Max and John's perspective. I'll put a link to Jen's website to the description box so you can get to know her as well. Here is a little passage from this book. Quote, I went through the entire bubble sheet, marking the questions he got wrong, which turned out to be most of them. He did get a few right, but then there were many times he filled in more than one answer for a question or skipped one. A thumb startled me, and I whirled around. Done, Ted announced, a smug grin on his face. He slapped his hand and the test paper down on the edge of the table. He hadn't had nearly enough time to complete all the math problems, so I was skeptical as I crossed the room and sat next to him. He flipped the sheet of paper towards me and went back to the love seat. Asher Wyatt's greatest hits started up again as I flipped to the back of the book where the answers were to compare them with Ted's bubble sheet. He'd gotten the first answer correct. No surprise there, as I'd basically told him how to solve the problem, but still, it was a good start. The good start ended there because when I checked question 2, I found that he'd filled both A and C. The answer was B. Hey, why'd you fill the two bubbles for number two? He stopped singing but kept strumming the guitar. Because it's the cat test. That made no sense, so I kept checking the answers. For question three, it once again filled in two bubbles, A and D. At least D was the correct answer, but test takers weren't allowed to fill in more than one bubble per question for the cats. It would make the entire answer invalid. Did he even know how to take the test? I couldn't fathom how someone could get the spring of their junior year without knowing the procedure for taking a standardized test. But this was the same guy who'd wanted to sneak a John Darling Tiger Lily romance subplot into Peter Pan. I think we need to start at the beginning, I said, trying to raise my voice over Ted's music without actually yelling. The cat short for college aptitude test is made up of four parts math reading science reasoning and writing you can only fill in one answer by question ted stopped strumming duh i hold up his answer sheet then why did you fill in multiple ovals for most of the questions he grinned because it's the cat test i know and it won't give you credit for a correct answer if you fill in more than that. Get it? He interrupted. The cat test. Then he laughed like crazy and blinked out a new melody. 
I didn't get it. All I knew was that the CAT test was an important part of college acceptance and his grandfather was paying me a lot of money to help him raise his score. He'd gotten a barely average score on the pre-CATs this fall and that wouldn't get him into a great college. I was starting to wonder how he'd even managed the average score. I let out a frustrated sigh and set the answer sheet down on the table. That's when I saw it. When I looked at his answer sheet from a distance, the ovals he'd filled in combined to make rudimentary outline of a cat figure. The cat test, he muttered to himself, laughing again. Okay, okay, very funny, I said, ripping another blank answer sheet out on the back of the study book. Take it for real this time. We need a baseline so we can measure your progress. Ted curled up his upper lip and shook his head. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. You have to. No, I don't. Your grandpa is paying me to teach you this. He shrugged one shoulder and flippant gesture that was quickly starting to grate on my nerves. Then I'll tell him you taught me. That's lying. No, it's not. You showed me how to do the gas minute problem. That's teaching me something he won't know. That's the only thing you taught me. He will when you take the real test and get a crappy score. He waved his hand as if it would wave away the problem too. We'll worry about that when it happens. I'm serious. If you want to do decent on this test, you need to do the practice ones. That's what I did. I took practice test after practice test and checked all my answers and figured out my mistakes on the ones I got wrong. Okay, fine, he grumbled. He stood up, set the guitar back on the coffee tape and took the new answer sheet out of my hand. When he sat down in the chair across from me, it was in an exaggerated huff, like I totally inconvenienced him. He glanced over at the first page and the practice test, and I set the alarm on my phone. I watched as he filled in one of the bubbles for the first problem, then one for the second, satisfied that he was going to take the practice test for real. I slipped my cockbook out of my backpack, getting a little studying in for Monday's test. Wouldn't be much productive than pondering Mr. Lawrence's eclectic taste in reading material. I mean, twilight, really? Before long, my phone peeped. I was in the middle of working on a problem, so I didn't look up. Five minutes, I warned, but before the words fully left my mouth, Ted's answer sheet sailed over my work. I picked it up and immediately saw that he'd filled in multiple ovals for several questions again. Ted... I groaned, squeezing my eyes shut in frustration. It's the dog test, he announced, sounding pretty proud of his joke. I opened my eyes, and sure enough, a big dog head complete with whiskers and a color decorated page made completely by shading in bubbles. I looked away, and my eyes fell on the bookcases. So many bookshelves, so many books in a room so fast that most of my trailer would fit inside, and a housekeeper who served as his personal alarm clock. He had all this, and a grandfather who was willing to overpay for tutoring service, so he could get a CAT score good enough to get into his college of choice. He didn't even have to worry about paying for college. All he had to do was get in, and he wasn't even trying. End quote. Laurie in Louisa May Alcott's Little Woman, he really doesn't like school or studying, and he is like 16 at this point. But that's why we have Amy who helps him to shape up his act. And quoting Laurie, 10 years after, he says, I'm not going to be a humbug any longer. One of the reasons why I think John is not as well-known character as Laurie and Frederick is because those two tend to be more extroverted, and John is more introverted. And one thing that I really like in Jen's version is the way she highlights John's amazement when he is working for the Lawrences and really sees how the other side lives because he comes from a very poor family and that is already written into the original little woman. I am giving you all a free month on Skillshare, so if you wish to become a writer yourself, you can check out all their courses on writing and other awesome skills. Link to your free month on Skillshare is in the description. 
and this is Small Brown in the Rain, Little Woman Podcast, the John Brooke Appreciation Episode. My name is Jen Brady, and I'm an author. I have in the past published several books that are more middle grade in nature and a couple of years ago I decided to branch out into young adult sweet romance and the first project I took on under this new genre to me was a retelling of Little Woman. So I have four books and there's one for each of the sisters. Uh, you can read them independently you don't have to read one before the other, but if you read them in order, there are threads that kind of weave among along the whole series. So it's best to read them in order, but you don't have to. Um, and I just had a lot of fun adapting Little Women for, you know, 2021. <laughs> one of my friends on Instagram, she had read some of your books and I told you that you are coming back and then she sent a question. Oh, yeah. She's cool. asking, what did you especially focus on when writing the Meg and John relationship in this century? Um, well, I guess it was the social aspect because so much was made of the wealth versus the poor in making the matches in the original and how so many women were wanting to or having to marry for money and how Meg kind of chose not to. She married for love. And in this day and age, yeah, that still can be something that, that happens. But women have a lot more opportunities now. Uh, they don't have to, to be told <laughs> that they need to consider uh, that kind of thing. So while the money issue was kind of in the book, it was more the social aspect of the popularity and the can this person get you where you want to be in life and you know that kind of thing rather than the money so I guess it, I focused mainly on the social aspect and what what the friends think and what you know your social circles are gonna say if you date someone who is maybe out of your social circle uh, that kind of thing because I see that a lot in you know teenagers and social media and high school life and I think that that is kind of a, a tough issue maybe more so than some of the things that were involved in the original book. I think the social aspect was also important in the 19th century but they definitely put way more weight on how wealthy the person was. Yeah. Unfortunately like you said there wasn't that many opportunities for women to have a job at all so it kind of makes sense that you had to marry someone who could provide to you and your family. Yeah, definitely. When I was reading your book, I did feel that it translated very well to this century because you brought the story to high school world where reputation is very important. And there are all these different social classes in high school in the same way that there is in Little Woman. I thought it translated very well to this particular story. Well, thanks. I kind of thought that it was the easiest one to adapt. Some of the other ones, I kind of really had to think hard about, you know, what would that, what would that look like in our time? That one, it pretty much kind of fell into place. There were a lot of really easy parallels. Yeah, like Meg going to Vanity Fair. Yeah, that's pretty easy to put into the context of trying to be popular in high school. I would like to ask you, when did you begin writing? I have old notebooks that you can barely read because my printing is so bad because I'm in like second grade that are basically fan fictions of various Saturday morning cartoons that my friends and I used to like to watch. So I love that. Yeah, I've been interested in writing and creating stories. And, you know, even what I did here, adapting or kind of expanding the world of characters and stories that I already 
enjoyed. So I liked doing the fan fiction when I was younger. And as I got older, I started creating my own stories and I just kind of never stopped writing. What other fandoms you like besides Little Woman? The big one for me growing up was Star Trek. My mom loved Star Trek, uh, the original series. So when I was old enough, I never really got into that one, but I loved The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. And I still, every now and then I'll go back and be like, okay, I'm going to watch a season of Star Trek. So I was real big into science fiction and fantasy. Star Wars is another one. I don't know why people think you have to have a favorite or choose between them because yeah. they're both awesome. <laughs> My husband and I have just been recently into The Mandalorian and the Boba Fett. And now we're waiting for our son to have some time so that we could all watch the new mm -hmm. Obi-Wan Kenobi one. Mm -hmm. So I was into a lot of science fiction and fantasy fandoms. My sister's a massive Star Trek fan. Well, there's so much Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> so you can... You can go down that rabbit hole for days. <laughs> she so only much. agreed to watch the 1978 Little Woman because it had William Shatner. Oh, <laughs> that's but, funny. But she did like it. Oh. oh, I thought of one other fandom that I was huge into. I still like, but as a teenager, oh my gosh, North and South, the miniseries. Oh, yeah. And I, I kind of watched that for the same reason as your sister, because um, Jonathan Frakes, who was on the next generation he was one of my favorite actors on that he was in north and south and so i started watching north and south and then i think it was like 30 minutes into it i was in love with that that fandom and my friends and i also wrote fan fiction about north and south <laughs> so. i think we talked about this a little bit the last time that perhaps john is not that popular as Laurie and Frederick because he's more introverted than he's extroverted yeah I would I would agree he's not one that really stands out on your first read or your first viewing of the the movie as much as maybe the other men but I've, I've always really liked John he just kind of seems like a strong Maybe that strong and silent kind of type. Yeah, he's not as much focused on in things either. Well, he really wasn't as, well, that's not true. I was going to say he wasn't in Little Women, the original book as much. But when you read the second half, The Good Wives, there is quite a bit of John. And then he's in some of the sequels too. So he's there. He just, yeah, he isn't as, I guess, exciting, but. I don't know. I, I thought he had some really good qualities, too. So I've always kind of been a fan of him. When I read Little Woman as a child, I didn't really pay that much attention to him. But then when I read Little Woman more as a mature person in Camp Lawrence uh, chapter, there's this moment mm -hmm. when he tells this story or they are like telling the story together. You know, that play where you make make up something yeah, and the other uh, continues. Yeah. And they each told their own little paragraph and. And uh, it's a story about a knife that goes to save a princess. And John's princess is McMarch. Yeah, he's pretty cool. <laughs> and and um, I thought when I read it for the first time, when I realized what I was reading as a teen, I was like, mm -hmm. that's a kind that's kind of racy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for back then it kind of probably was. Because yeah. Meg was 17 and he was maybe... Yeah. 27, 28. There was some kind of an age gap there as well. Yeah. It was pretty normal back then. So yeah. I don't think it's yeah, well, they, appropriate for the time period. Yeah. Inappropriate. They didn't, they didn't even bat an eye at it, it didn't seem, because they would talk about Joe and Frederick having a big age gap, but no one ever said anything about Meg and John, even though, you know, they had 10 years or eight years or whatever. But yeah, that was pretty common. Lusa May Alcott, she had a thing for older guys. Older so. guys, yeah. And I think as a kid, when I was reading Little Women, and maybe this is where he kind of gets lost in the the shuffle, you fo you're more focused on the kid characters, the teenage characters, and he's always an adult. So maybe, maybe that's why he doesn't make as much of an impression, especially on our first read-throughs, because a lot of times we're kids or teenagers when we first first read the story i think in the chapter uh, camp lawrence 
there's mm -hmm. also the moment when he is rowing the boat with Meg and then Laurie is are they his cousins, the rich cousins. Mm -hmm. No, not cousins, friends. Friends, yeah. From England, the, the girl is like, what are you doing for a living? And Meg is like, I am a governess. And then she's like, oh, you have to work. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you have to work? And right. John is like, I think being a governess is a really cool thing. And I just later on realized that, well, they're both teachers. <laughs> yeah, they are. I liked how he kind of kind of swoops in and tells, is it Kate? I think yeah. her name is Kate. But uh, Kate the Wong. snobby sister. Yeah, the Wait snobby sister, sister yeah. of Fred. You know, maybe it, it's different in England, but here it, it's looked up to if you can go support yourself and working isn't a bad thing. He He really valued that Meg was helping her family and a hard worker and kind of went in and was talking about that to get Kate off her back almost. That was one of those moments that really made me fall in love with John's character mm -hmm. later on. But yeah, I think yeah. he's more more of an introvert and with pet maybe, and then the others mm -hmm. to be more extroverted. Yeah, I think so. And that's probably why he isn't as focused on, but he's still a great character. Did you use your own high school, college memories when writing this book? Maybe a little, but I was not like Meg at all. I was more of a shy Beth. I was never in with the in crowd or doing things like going to prom. And I guess I was more like the John character, not really feeling like I fit in in high school. And I was quiet and like to read and so maybe maybe you're right and I did draw on my <laughs> high school experiences I'm just now realizing but it wasn't for Meg it was for the John character you know the movie Mean Girls um, yes when they go through all the clicks in the high school scenario and then they go to the art art students that's where I was okay <laughs> it's a good place to be too <laughs> Yeah, that's why I didn't like school that much. But when I went to art school, there was no cliques because we all came from that. All art students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah high school wasn't my favorite time at no. all. <laughs> um, it wasn't like a horrid experience or anything. I wasn't like horribly bullied or anything like that. But I just didn't really feel like I fit in there. I found my friends, my true friends in college and also at summer camp. Um, I was real big into summer camp and that's actually what I wrote about for the, my first series for 10, 15 years. That's kind of what I worked on. Mm. Books about summer camp because that was more my things that had made an impression on me and a place where I'd had really good time. I knew I went to summer camp. <laughs> oh, you should have. It was so fun. Well, I had fun time in art school. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I bet it's probably very similar in the whole finding people that you have things in common with, like you said, there aren't cliques anymore because everybody loves art and has the same kind of viewpoint. That's kind of what camp was. That's true. I was thinking, what does Little Woman, the original novel, tell us about John's background? Because I don't think it tells that much. All I remember is he took care of his mom or something. It kind of made, it kind of alluded that she might have been elderly and ill or something. I kind of went with the having to take care of the mom, but in a different way with um, addiction and stuff like that, rather than, because they really don't say much. You don't know. It's kind of a mystery, but that's basically what they say. And that I, he might have had a brother, maybe, in the original. I've written to my notes, he had ill mother who he sent yeah. money to, and maybe a brother. Yeah, I don't think they really got into the backstory very much. Yeah. It's the same with Fredrik's character, only that he had a sister who right. sadly died. And two nephews. And the nephews. and John went to war. And in your version, he's planning to go to the Marines. Was that right? Um, National Guard. National Guard. Which is because I wanted him to be able to be accessible for other books. <laughs> mm. If I would have sent him off. <laughs> <laughs> the Marines or the Army or something, he'd be gone. So I did National Guard because they have their regular boot camp and stuff, but then they live 
basically civilian lives, but they have training every, I think it's once a month, they'll have a training. And, oh, okay. But, so in your version, John's mom had addiction with alcohol. He came from a very poor background and he tried to fake to his friends and everyone else that he came from a normal home. And then we have Meg also trying to fake to her friends that she enjoys being the popular it girl. Yeah, because in the Meg goes to Vanity Fair, a lot of times what they focus on is, oh, Meg dresses up and Meg, they, they almost make it out that, oh, she's having fun and this is great and this is what she really wants. And, and she did. She did want to, you know, run with that crowd. But she also realized things she didn't like about it when she's being talked about <laughs> and when she's just realizing, you know, I thought I wanted to run with this crowd, but maybe there's some negatives too. So I tried to kind of focus on that in my book, the discovering who you are and maybe that's not what you thought you wanted in life when you mature and grow up a little bit. I think that's a huge theme in Little Woman in the original mm-hmm. book as well, that the things that you want as a teenager are not necessarily those things that you want as an adult. Yeah, definitely. That's You can see that in a few of the different storylines Yeah, in Louisa May Alcott's. Joe says that her castle in the air is to write books and own horses and be filthy rich. But then right. in the second book, there's the chapter All Alone, she realizes she wants companionship and mm, she wants someone to have a life with. Exactly. She still, she still does want to be a writer and she, she does write, but I think she's happier with the life that she ends up making for herself than the life that she maybe imagined as a 15 year old. And I think what Meg wanted, she wanted to be popular and oh, have yeah. nice things and rich and she wanted to be like her friends and throwing the balls and buying the expensive fabric and keeping it and the the pretty dresses and the servants and all that and then in the second part she no longer wants those things no she just wants to be wife and mom and her own little little family and it seems like she's pretty happy doing that it is a big part of little woman storylines then you had Lori making pranks. That was one of my favorite parts in the original. And they don't, they don't often adapt that. But they did in my introduction to Little Women, which, which was the cartoon from Japan in the 80s. I distinctly remember the episode where, where Lori is doing the back and forth um, letters. And one of the reasons I remember it is because they changed the name on the paper. They called him Carl or something. The, when the people were speaking, they said John. And then when they show the letter in the in the cartoon, it says like Carl or Kevin or something at the bottom. And my friend and I would always rewind it. And the character says, as she's reading it, your servant John Brooks or something but it clearly says a different name and my friend and I always thought that was hilarious so we'd rewind that part in the 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 tapes that my grandma would tape for us so I distinctly remember this prank part and it's never in the movies and I'm always disappointed so I wanted to make sure that I adapted the prank uh, of the fake letters to and Mm. from Meg and John only now it's 2021, so it was texting, of course. Mm-hmm. When I read your book, I thought this is uh, the language is something that I could imagine him to use. He wrote in a way that Meg could recognize that wasn't written by John. Yeah. But it's worse in the original because Meg actually thinks that the letters came from John and she even replies to them. Yeah. So, it, it's really a vicious thing that he does in the original, but nobody speaks about it. Well, I do, but nobody else yeah. really <laughs> seems to do yeah. that. There's a few parts that really stuck out to me, either from the cartoon or the original book, 
when I was younger that like have stayed with me. And now when I read it, I get to that part. I'm like, oh, that's one of my favorite parts. And they don't often pick it to the, to do the adaptations. Like one of my other favorite parts is the Amy and the art fair. So I made sure to put the art fair in my my fourth book, which is the Amy book. But they never have the whole art fair debacle with the rival artist who gets her table and it's it really shows how she's grown as a character because she handles that disappointment pretty classy yeah whereas amy from the first book little women rather than good wives or is that in is that in i can't remember the younger amy definitely would have not handled that well she would have picked up a fit and freaked out and older Amy was very gracious and Mm. I always liked that part and they never put that in any of the adaptations the pranks and the art fair the two big ones I can think of that I wanted to make sure got in there so that is the benefit of creating your own version that you can add the things that you want to have there true Another thing that they never add is the symposium with Joe and Frederick, which is one of my favorites in the, oh, yeah. the novel. Is that in the Winona Ryder one? There's something similar when they meet and they have the discussion about philosophy. Yeah. And he kind of cuts in and says he thinks women should be able to tell their opinions. Yeah, but it's just like a 30 second scene probably. Yeah, you're right. They never do put that in. Oh, yeah, in the 1994 film, they kind of show that. But yeah, you're right. They never show it in full. And I think that's the only one. That's the only one I can remember having it in. Yeah. The symposium part. In the 2017, he invites her to the symposium, but then they don't include the symposium. And it makes me so angry. Is that the miniseries? Yeah, the miniseries. Yes, like it was two, two or three episodes or something. Yeah. I liked that one. I've only seen it once, though. So I don't remember that one as well as some of the others. All the Hollywood people bring the symposium to the Little Woman adaptation. Yeah. (laughs) Please. And thinking uh, about the art fair, I think they should also include that or something like that. Because if I remember right, there are these moments there where Amy and Laurie are a bit flirtatious in the book Mm -hmm. why that is not (laughs) in the movie I don't know well I mean I've always said they need to do a good old-fashioned like we were talking about north and south 80s miniseries where it goes on for like six or seven days for two hours a day they need to do something like that with little women because it's such a massive book and 90 minutes or two hours just isn't enough time I mean I had trouble putting everything in to four different books that I wanted to fit in. Some things had to just fall by the wayside. And that was four different books. So I'm sure that the time restraints make it so that they can't. But man, wouldn't it be great to have an actual long mini series that you can fit all these fun little lesser known scenes into? I would love that. And I have the whole idea that they should include like Laurie's point of view and then Friedrich's point of view and his life yeah. in Berlin. Oh, I, yeah. I love that. That would be fun. That was yeah. a, something that was fun about writing the book. I ended up doing eight viewpoints in the end, two per book. So it was kind of funny to write from the John point of view or the Laurie point of view or the Friedrich because I think we mainly get Joe's and then a little bit of Meg and Amy in the Mm. original. Yeah. Uh, But not, you know, it's all kind of under the lens of Louisa May Alcott, which is great. She's a great writer, but it kind of all, I don't know, it was like all under one viewpoint. And I always kind of wondered, you know, what these other characters thought. You know, how does, Mm. what does Beth think about being the peacemaker of the family? You know, is it, is it exhausting (laughs) or is it, oh, someone's coming into my room. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It's all right. My husband and my cat just walked in. So (laughs) just wait a minute. 
waving back. Uh, I was thinking about um, the 1949 film. There's this moment where Laurie is like, why do you need to work, Joe? Do you need money? I, I have lots of money. Like, he doesn't really understand why the girls have to work. And right. I, I think I saw some of that in your in your book as well, because Laurie is unproductive and he's lazy because everything has been handed over to him. He doesn't have to work and he doesn't have to to really try for anything. And I think when you grow up like that, you don't really understand. You can't really comprehend that there is another way of life for other people. I liked your book because it showed clearly that uh, how John is blown away when he enters the Lawrence home. And then he lives in the trailer park. He's really poor. But I think in the original book, it does mention how, how the girls are really poor and how John is very poor. But mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like the modern readers don't really pay that much attention to the, the differences. It's hard yeah. for us to, to realize because as modern readers, we, we see, oh, they have, they have a maid. Or, oh, so they don't, they don't have a carriage. Well, you know, big deal. I bet a lot of people didn't have carriages, but it's, it's hard. It's hard for us to get what the constructs of the social class were back then. Because to us, it's all foreign. And most of us come from middle class families. Yeah. Yeah. So it's difficult to um, put yourself into that position because you don't see that in your everyday life. Whereas for us now, it might be like, oh, your family can't afford a car or tech. Um, Tech is a big thing, probably. Uh, So I tried to put it in terms that people would understand nowadays, like, oh, you can't afford a phone or that kind of thing. It is hard for us to immerse ourselves in the world of the 1800s and to know what would what would show that you had money or didn't or that is that is a tough tough thing to figure out as we're we're reading the original i also understood why john had to lie about his background because when you were in high school you don't want to stand out too much from the crowd i think right like no one wants to really be different yeah, you want to you want to blend in and not have people pay too much attention to you. In your version, John and uh, Meg, they meet in the uh, drama class. Oh yeah, that's another thing that they don't adapt very much. They that Meg really wanted to be an actress and she loved acting. And they'll show like Joe's plays and the Christmas scene where all the kids fall through the couch because there's too many people sitting there and Amy's messing up her lines and not fainting right but they don't really center around the fact that Meg was really into acting so Mm -hmm. I tried to kind of put that in they show bits of their plays in the movies Mm -hmm. I think in the 1994 film they do mention that in the 19th century uh, you know being an actor it was seem a bit suspicious uh, as a career when I read some of these books that Louisa May Alcott liked to read like Wilhelm Meister and like other German type of literature get uh, he criticizes life of act Google lock me out and I had to log in <laughs> oh no geez come on Google <laughs> don't you know that people want to talk about little women for more than 40 minutes at a time yeah they should know my habits already yeah they should Louisa May Alcott she sometimes kind of criticizes actors life like in Joe's voice I think Maggie's still like acting but she she still prefers to be mom and doing those homely things but I was thinking maybe it's because of that sort of bad reputation that the actors had back then maybe that's why she she didn't become a full-time actor Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it's still not something that, like, a parent would be thrilled to hear. (laughs) 
I want to be an actor. My mom wasn't very happy when I said I want to go to art school. <laughs> One of our kids wants to go to art school. My sister, she she's an actress in an improvisation theater. Oh, okay. But she never wanted to make that her full-time job. Right. It's like a fun thing that you do. Yeah. It's like a creative than... outlet for her. Yeah. Oh, so... I, I get it. Because with writing, when it was just a hobby... I always had ideas and Mm. couldn't wait to sit down and write. And now that I'm trying to, you know, make a writing career and you look at the numbers and the money and sometimes it can be a little daunting to sit down and, and actually come up with something because it's just so much more pressure. I think that's why it's taken me this long to finally, after finishing the March sisters, series get back into really the groove of writing I had several months where I was organizing my house and purging things from the closet and scraping paint off of our outbuildings so we could paint them and a lot of that was you know avoiding avoiding having to sit down and come up with another world so I get that it's it's hard when your artistic um, endeavors merge with career you know meg is not the only one who have these questions because then we have joe who really struggles with her writing career Mm -hmm. in the second part of the books she wrote those trashy novels Mm -hmm. and then when freddy came she started to take herself more seriously as a writer it's hard to find a balance between right to market and writing you know, what you really love to write and what you you feel drawn to writing. But if you're going to make a career out of it, it has to sell. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's not something just from Joe's time. It definitely, yeah. it definitely influenced me wanting to change genres and do the young adult romance because it's it's popular. The key is finding something that's popular that you really want to write, (laughs) like Little Women adaptations. It was, it was so much fun that I didn't mind doing a popular genre. When you enjoy it, that's the best part. In 19th century, if you were an actor, and then if you would like to combine that with, with a family, that might not have been so easy. I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure those kinds of careers are hard now too and we have you know more quicker and more reliable forms of transportation and we have the internet and we have Mm. zoom and I'm sure it's it seems like it's really hard now but I can't imagine back then when they didn't have any of these forms of communication and travel it would have been almost impossible for someone like Meg to have a family and a acting career sometimes I come across these people who complain that Meg doesn't become an actress when I read the book I don't think she's that much into acting I think she cared more about having a family yeah I think so too and also how many how many times do we say as a kid oh I'm going to be an actor or I'm going to be an astronaut or I'm going to be a whatever and most of us when we're older don't end up being an actor or an astronaut or some lofty goal that very few people in this world (laughs) actually end up doing so I wanted to be an archaeologist oh that's that sounds really fun I have a friend who actually is an archaeologist but she's the only one I know who is yeah and I was really very close to applying to university to go to study archaeology but I ended up going to art school okay but, you know, maybe Either someday one. I could go Either back. One sounds good. Yeah, you definitely could. Yeah, if I would want to, but not, yeah. not so much now. Yeah. I still like history and doing this podcast. That's one of those things. Like when you're a history yeah, nerd, this is a really good podcasting to do. Yeah. My Algot's life. So, and what you do is kind of like archaeology because you're looking to, into all these sources and, you know, with Louisa May Alcott's letters and. Mm. All the things written about her and, okay, now, what were the times like? When you read the, the original, 
<laughs> you said like you said he was he was funny but then also annoying i think there is some kind of this sort of um thin line when funny becomes a bit annoying yeah especially when you're a teenager yeah i think so there is a fine line between being funny and crazy and goofy and taking things too far and I think especially with teenagers it's easy to cross that line especially when you're with your friends or there's people people you want to impress we all have that one friend that we can really get into trouble with and I think that was Joe and Lori were each other's one friend but and it's funny in the original when he's composing the opera in Vienna after Joe has uh, rejected him. Mm -hmm. There's this moment when he calls Joe a torment. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when you call her a torment, why are you pinning on her (laughs) for that? I think it was the art fair chapter. There's this moment when Laurie is really frustrated when Joe is preaching him about Mm -hmm. about college. Yeah, because he he kind of did... He was like going to gambling rooms or whatever and being wild. Sometimes it's just mind-blowing to me that people want Joe and Laurie to get there because I know Laurie has a crush on Joe, but then he also thinks Joe is a torment and he is so annoyed with Joe. Laurie doesn't like yeah. Joe always that much. I think there was some kind of a need to have Joe in his life because he needed someone to tell him what to do with his life. Yeah. But when I was reading your book, I thought it was interesting because there were some moments when John makes these observations that Laurie goes to do these things that Joe wants to do that he doesn't want to do himself. Because he just wants to, you know, be with her and do stuff she wants to do. He watched films that no, won Academy Awards. Movies. <laughs> yeah, the movies that she wanted to watch that he thought were stupid. Stuff like that. And it was very close to the book. I kind of feel sad for Laurie because I felt like he was wasting his time on on Joe. Then I feel bad for Joe because he he was really like pitting on her when she didn't want his attention. Yeah, it's not romantic. There's not much romantic about um, about their relationship. That's why I loved that cartoon because they were very clearly friends. And had like a brother and sister kind of relationship. And they fought in that cartoon. And I remember a scene where Orion gets mad at her and comes into his house and is like kind of huffing and puffing and like throws his hat at the door. And it, it, it clearly shows that they drive each other crazy, but are still very dear friends, which, you know, is, is pretty common with a, mm. a close friend, brother, or sister kind of relationship. But yeah, so when I was watching the movies as a teenager or a kid, I didn't understand that either. Like, why? Because from what I read and seen in the cartoon, I'm like, why is this like a a love thing when they never really were? One of my friends said that it's not really a love thing. It's actually Laurie just that he just yeah. wants to have sex with her. Oh, <laughs> maybe there is some maybe that. but I think it was more I mean maybe I don't know but I think it was more like he he just felt like he belonged in the family and and loved the whole family and nowadays you can be an add-on to a family in any way shape or form but in those times I think you add it on by getting married and so mm-hmm. that was kind of the logical progression because when Laurie proposes Joe it feels like there is he feels a lot more immature than Joe in that scene Mm -hmm. because he says these things like I gave up billiards and all to be with you yeah he he gets a little silly there it's a really funny line when he says that it's such a bad reason for Joe to marry that he just wants to like play house with her yeah and it shows how he's grown up and been handed everything so he's like well but I did this Mm. that was probably a lot of work for him wow I gave this up Mm -hmm. I gave something up I this is big stuff and she's not reacting the way he thought she would (laughs) 
everything else is I want this. Okay, here you go. Yeah. I think he didn't he didn't know what to do or how to act when he doesn't get the thing he says he wants. That was our discussion for today. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and make good choices. Bye.